Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. reading from the book of Genesis. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now please join me by reading aloud Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, 
Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I have perplexity in my mind and grief in my heart day after day? How long shall my enemy triumph over me? Look upon me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes as I sleep in death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him, and my foes rejoice that I have fallen. But I put my trust in your mercy. My heart is joyful because of your saving help. I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt with me richly. I will praise the name of the Lord, most high. St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, and to greater and greater iniquity. So now, present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which now you are so ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin, and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. 
Let us pray. Grant, Lord God, to all who have been baptized into the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, that as we have put away the old life of sin, so we may be renewed in the spirit of our minds and live in righteousness and true holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, once again, if you can't hear me in the back, you're going to have to put, I think I can see you, uh, you're going to have to put your hand up, okay? <clears throat> First, a word about the reading from Genesis. It's a very familiar reading. It's a foundational reading. Foundational not only to us, but to our elder brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith. The story of the binding of Isaac, the Akedah, is read at Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the new year, the beginning of the High Holy Days. That tells you something of the importance of the story. It is also important to us in the Episcopal tradition, certainly since the new prayer book, the new prayer book that's what, 40 years old now? <laughs> Something like that. Because it is appointed not only for random Sundays, like this Sunday, in the three-year cycle of the lectionary, but it is also one of the optional readings for Good Friday, and also one of the lessons appointed for the Easter Vigil that should give you some sense of how foundational the story is. And it is a terrible story. It is a story that we've heard so often that some of the horror disappears and dissipates. But if you think about, those of you who were in church last Sunday or read last Sunday's lessons on your own, if you think about it, Abram's already lost one son, Ishmael dismissed to the wilderness. And now he has this message, this dream, this encounter with the Holy, who says, and this is the part I want you to pay attention to, take your son, your only son, Isaac, the son whom you love. He still has a son out in the wilderness. But the words of this text tell us something very important, something that's an echo of what I said last Sunday about the fun in dysfunction. The patriarchal narratives have holy people who are really twisted, holy people who struggle towards holiness, holy people who have encounters with God that are completely confusing and confounding. And I would ask you to think about this. Is that not unlike? That is exactly like many of our encounters with God the deeper we go in the journey of faith. It's not all sweetness and light and easy going. And this reading, which you've heard over and over again, is Exhibit A. That's not the sermon. <laughs> <clears throat> Speaking for myself alone, I find the juxtaposition of the portion of Paul's letter to the Romans assigned for today, that juxtaposition with our approaching national observance of Independence Day, to be rather jarring. Maybe you do, too. Even if you are not discomfited by the contrast of two sets of sacred text, the one found in the New Testament and the other in our canonical founding document, the Declaration of Independence, it is important to note that we are being confronted with some critical questions about how we live out our baptismal covenant 
as members of the body of Christ, the church, and how we think about our rights and responsibilities as citizens of this country. I hasten to add, as I have said in many previous sermons around this day, here and elsewhere, I hasten to add that this is not a political sermon, except in so far as being a citizen of the reign of God may pose some actual spiritual tensions, if not conflicts, with our citizenship in these United States, to which we may need to be attentive. So let's begin with where Paul finds us. Now, if there were Bibles in your pews, which I don't think there are, or you had a copy of last Sunday's service leaflet, at this point, I would ask you to look at the very beginning of Romans chapter 6, which we read last week. Verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. There's a lot of emphasis there. You can't just sort of gloss over it. By no means. How can we who died to sin continue living in it? Now, look at the second paragraph of today's reading from Romans. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. It's a lot of emphasis, a lot of emphasis. And repetition, twice in one chapter. And repetition of thought and words can mean any number of things. Lack of a good editor, which many of Paul's, Pauline scholars have observed, he could have used a good editor, stop some of those run-on sentences that go on for many, many lines. Or, could be the writer's attempt to hammer home some very important thought or concept of which the readers ought to take note. Paul has one sermon basically to preach, one letter basically to write, and he writes it again and again. And in the case of oral tradition, the case of a parent addressing a child, there is sometimes an irrational hope that repetition will finally cause something to stick and a desired change of behavior will ensue. We live in hope. I think all three of these readings apply to Paul. We believe that many, if not all, of Paul's letters were dictated to a secretary or what they called an amanuensis, and it is not clear that at the time Paul or anyone else revised them. Paul has recurrent themes in his letter that were also probably present in his preaching, but one of the big ones is that Christian life begins and ends with grace, being buried with Christ in his death and raised with him in his resurrection makes us a new creation, and that our living out of that grace will necessarily impact all of our behaviors, our practices, our relationships, our ethic, as it were. Paul is very clear that there has been a fundamental change in our essential identities, and there are consequences of that change. Sometimes we think it's just private, but it's not, because we live in families and communities and parishes and in states and countries. Today's epistle reading begins before his repetition, with imperative statements, that is, command statements. Do not, no longer present, but present. Don't do these things because you are no longer under, because you are no longer under sin's dominion, a word that not, does not appear often in our daily conversation, but we may also read it as power, or control, or even sway, 
actually there's about 232 words in English that could be used for dominion. I looked it up. <laughs> and then Paul's next move is something that is very disconcerting to 21st century human beings, especially Americans. Paul is writing out of his own times and context, a context in which everyone knew what slavery meant in the first century of the common era around the Mediterranean basin. Indeed, among those Christians who received, read, or heard this letter in Rome, there were undoubtedly those who were slaves and others who might have been servants. More slaves than servants. Paul begins his letter in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a doulos of Jesus Christ. The principal meaning of the Greek word doulos is slave, not servant, slave. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. The various English translations that use the word servant, or even bondservant, which was not a category in Greek, it was from the Hebrew tradition, they are attempting to deal with the offensiveness of the word slave in our day or in other historical contexts, by softening it, by taking away the offense. But Paul's intention is to call our attention to something he believes is true of himself and of all the baptized. We no longer belong to ourselves as if we ever did. We belong to God in Christ. Paul writes that obedient slaves are slaves of the one they obey. That's pretty obvious. <clears throat> and he encourages our brothers and sisters at Rome to live as slaves of righteousness, <clears throat> to become like him, a slave of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus Christ who is referred to in an early Christian hymn that Paul quotes in the second chapter of his earlier letter to the church at Philippi. Have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself, taking the form of a doulos, a slave. Paul wants us to know and understand that the one in whose death and resurrection we now live became a slave for the sake of all. The account of the washing of the disciples' feet at the Last Supper in the Gospel of John shows us a portrait of Jesus taking the position of a slave. And so we are called to be there too with him for the sake of others. Now, how are you and I to hear and receive such declarations as 21st century Western Christians, especially two days before Independence Day? I think that you and I tend to resolve our discomfort by dividing our loyalties. For many of us, it is easier to live with cognitive dissonance by compartmentalizing our response to the call to live as the new creation as something that's just spiritual, but to consider our real life as demanding a more practical ethic. The risk of separating our call to live by walking before God in holiness and righteousness all our days, as the general thanksgiving in the Book of Common Prayer puts it, separating that from the nitty-gritty day-to-day challenges where sacrifice and faithfulness seem to have very little value, is that our hearts will indeed be divided. And the spiritual energy that we believe we were protecting will be stifled and become lifeless. We're not exercising it in the real world, the only world we live in. In the days of deep challenges posed by the world around us, perhaps even within the boundaries of this nation, 
there will likely be little left for us from which to draw spiritual strength. Indeed, history shows us many examples, but this is the one that is a prime example. It is easy, it's incredibly easy, and how this can happen. And when it happens, it is in fact what happened that crippled the witness of the German Lutheran Church under Nazism. The majority of the church went along with it, and they hung the banners in their churches. And they, well, I suppose they prayed for the fewer, but basically they didn't question anything he did because that would be costly. Those inalienable rights so beautifully proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are held as gospel truth, as it were, by many. Though Frederick Douglass, a fugitive slave in continuous danger of being captured and returned to his owners in Maryland, declared in his famous 1852 speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July, that these words held no meaning for the millions of enslaved human beings in this country at that time. Douglas took to task the institutions of American culture and governance, including the churches, for thinking that all must join in our great national celebration of Independence Day. Douglas observed that for those who were considered three-fifths of a human being, the call to celebrate the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness rang very hollow. And though the Civil War was fought, emancipation was proclaimed, and the 13th and 14th Amendments were adopted, there are still profound injustices throughout this beloved country of ours. Human trafficking, not only sex trafficking, but for other forms of exploitation, exists all over this country, certainly in every major city and even in small towns and rural areas. In some places in our country, prison labor takes place on large tracts of land that was once plantation property and remains legal under the 13th Amendment amounting to involuntary servitude. We've justified it as punishment. And you and I spend our money in this country on goods that were produced by enslaved families, adults, and children in other parts of the world, knowingly or unknowingly. Might our national life be more fruitful and less divided, more just and compassionate, of people, if people of faith were to live more fully integrated lives, where the spiritual gifts of the various religious traditions that bring such richness to our country <coughs> would contribute to the always ongoing and always necessary efforts to build a more perfect union here. Maybe. What I do believe is this, if those who follow the crucified and risen Lord, the one who knelt on the floor before his disciples, taking on the task that a household servant could not be forced to do, remember that our lives are gifts to be offered for the sake of others, not only those with whom we share faith, but also this nation and this world. It could help. Within our families and within Christian communities of all sorts, we learn that what we have often walled off as the spiritual life is in fact a necessary Christian ethic and practice by which you and I are to conduct every aspect of how we live in this world. We are blessed to have the liberty to do so. And pursuing the common good turns out to be indeed the pursuit of happiness for all. So, maybe we ought to start here and start now, 
by remembering at all times and in every circumstance that in Paul's words, you and I have been bought with a price, purchased, and that we have become in Christ a new creation, that we might live no longer for ourselves alone, but for the one into whose death and resurrection we have been baptized. Living with conscious awareness of how interdependent we are both in the world and in the church may well help us to celebrate more joyfully with our fellow citizens not only the birth of our country, but also a more fully realized commonwealth for which freely chosen sacrifices must often be made for the good of all. I invite you to take your prayer books the red books in your pews, I think they're there. <clears throat> Turn to page 98. And using suffrages form B, please join me as we pray. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Day by day, we bless you. Lord, keep us from sin today. Have your mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never hope in vain. Amen. of the people form four may be found on page 388 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, 
that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the needs and concerns of this community. For all those affected by the Canadian wildfires, for seasonable weather, for all refugees and their supporters, for the clients, staff, and volunteers at the 1269 Cafe, for all elected officials in every level of government, and all church leaders in every order of ministry, especially our own wardens and vestry, for all those for whom no one prays, for Rector Marjorie and her family, for our parish as we discern what it means to be us and how God is calling us to live into that now, for the Gabbard family, the Pat family, the Young family, and for Carol. For whom else shall we pray? I ask your prayers for all in need of God's healing power, for Jim, Carrie, Kate, Autumn, Chrisanne, Lori, Kate, Frank, Judy, Mary Alice, Julie, Warren, Betsy, Mike, Leona, Beth, Marie, Usma, Jean, Mike, Greg, Anne-Marie, Noel, Holly, Al, Elizabeth, Carol, Kim, Roger, Jackie, Baby Wallace, Eric, <coughs> Holly, Kitty, Wilman, Ian entering hospice, Steve, Jane, Bob, Ethan, Eric, Dylan, Gail, Anna, Richard, Eric, Steve, Beth, Carol, and Joan. Continuing prayers for our presiding bishop, Michael Curry. For whom else shall we pray? Isaac, Norman, Abby, Jason, Jason, Michael, and Jesse. I ask your prayers for all who have died, remembering especially Jim Gabbard. Marie Papp, and Mary Ann Kennerly. May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace and let light perpetual shine upon them. For whom else shall we pray? For our Muslim brothers and sisters who this past week celebrated the feast of Eid al-Adha, the story of which we read this morning, Abraham and the Sacrifice. We have much in God. Let us give thanks for all the blessings of this life, for the lives and memories of those in whose honor the flowers and sanctuary life are given, for Reverend Nancy's presence with us, and for the Kesselman's 35th anniversary. For what else shall we give thanks?
for the Tonner's 54th anniversary. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess our sins against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry.
be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and lead them into all truth. Uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever say this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Michael, Mark, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 